My Lords, I too stand to speak uh, on, in support of amendments 2093 and 123 in the names of Baroness Kidron, Lord Bethel, Lord Stevenson and myself, and in support of Amendment 74 in the name of Baroness Kidron. And I want to pay tribute to the courage of all noble lords and their teams and the Minister and the Bill team in their work on this part of the Bill. It seems to me that uh, this work involves the courage to dare to look at some very difficult material which sadly shapes the everyday life of too many young people. This group of amendments is part of a package of measures to strengthen the protections for children in this bill by introducing a new schedule of harms to children and plugging a chronological gap between Part 3 and Part 5 services over when protection from pornography comes into effect. Every so often in these debates, we've been reminded of the connection with real lives and real people. And I spent some time yesterday evening uh, speaking uh, on the telephone with Amanda and Stuart Stevens, the mum and dad of Ollie Stevens, who live in Reading, which is part of the Diocese of Oxford. Noble Lords will remember that Ollie was tragically murdered, aged 13, in a park near his home by teenagers of a similar age. Social media played a significant part in the investigation and in the life of Ollie and his friends, specifically social media posts normalising knife crime and violence with such a deep and tragic outcome. Last year, Panorama dared to look into this world in June. And the Panorama programme reveals the depth and extent of the normalisation of knives and knife crime in posts offered to young people. I was struck by the comments of Frances Hagen, filmed when she met with Stuart and Amanda. She said, each of us sees social media through a pinhole, a tiny snapshot of the total content. We have no idea how much darkness and evil is shaping children and young people, destroying their sense of proportion and deeply affecting offline behaviour. The only group who have the whole picture are, of course, the companies themselves. Baroness Kidron and others have outlined the remarkable degree of support for this raft of amendments from charities working to protect children. We should listen. These amendments will ensure a much wider definition of harm and will again future-proof the bill in terms of technology which is even now coming over the horizon. The Centre for Countering Digital Hate speak about an arms race to devise ever more effective ways of keeping users' attention, even if it means putting them at risk. Their researchers set up new accounts in the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada and Australia at the minimum age TikTok allows 13 years old. Those accounts paused briefly on videos about body image and mental health and liked them. What the researchers found was deeply disturbing. Within 2.6 minutes, TikTok recommended suicide content. Within eight minutes, TikTok served content relating to eating disorders. Every 39 seconds, TikTok recommended videos about body image and mental health to teens. CCDH researchers found a community for eating disorder content on the platform amassing 13.2 billion views across 56 hashtags, often designed to evade moderation. As Baroness Kidron said, this fourfold classification of harms to children is being adapted elsewhere in the world, including the European Union. The schedule in the amendment gives clear but non-exhaustive examples to guide service providers on the meaning of each of the four Cs. It is vital to have more comprehensive agreed definitions of harm on the face of the bill. Reflect for a moment on what each of the four Cs mean. 
Content harms are the most familiar. At the moment, children who go online are likely to encounter age-inappropriate content, including violent, gory and graphic communication, hate speech, terrorism, online prostitution, drugs, eating disorders and self-harm. Research also shows that exposure to different types of harmful content is interrelated. So if a child reports seeing one type of disturbing content, it's likely they've seen others as well. Second, contact harms encourage harmful actions in the non-virtual world. A 10-year-old girl was left with burns after spraying an aerosol deodorant with the nozzle right up against her skin to create a freezing sensation. Jane Platt's daughter Sarah, aged 15, was rushed to hospital in February 2020 after doing the Skull Breaker Challenge, which involves two people kicking the legs from under a third, making them fall over. These suggestions could never be offered in young people's magazines or broadcast media. Third, contact harms, conduct harms. In a global survey, 54% of young people, 57% of girls, 48 of boys, reported having experienced online sexual harms before they were 18 years old, including within interaction with adults and being asked something sexually explicit or sent sexually explicit content, 54%. And finally, commercial harms. Over half of the games on Google Play now include loot boxes, and more than 93% of games that feature loot boxes are marked suitable for children aged 12 years plus. As Baroness Kidron and others have argued, these harms are often cumulative and interrelated. The social media companies are the only ones not looking through a keyhole, but monitoring social media in the round and able to assess what is happening. Evidence suggests they will not do so until compelled by legislation. These amendments are a vital step forward in fulfilling the Bill's purpose of providing additional protection from harm for children. I urge the Government to adopt them. Uh, my Lords, 